Allison, how do you feel about being interviewed? Well, naturally, you you feel uh, quite mixed about it. That uh, you and you feel the fascination. I'm fascinated by how uh, the interviewer's mind works. I'm uh, and I'm also aware that uh, for all my uh, shunning of a public role which uh, is divorced from my identity as a writer, any kind of uh, statement that I make, anytime my face appears, uh, there are a lot of people who are going to be uh, interpreting uh, my face, my statements in terms of my racial identity rather than in terms of the quality of what I have to say. What up YouTube, knowledge and self-determination. Back at you guys with some more Black History Every Day. Today we'll be going back to March 1st, 1914 when Ralph Waldo Ellison, author of the award-winning Invisible Man, is born in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. And just a quick note, I would definitely suggest that um, that his book, Invisible Man, is um, definitely on your reading list. Um, I think, I like a lot of, I like books from, written by uh, authors, especially black authors during, during slavery or more likely you'll find books written after slavery during Reconstruction, the early 20th century, um, and the Jim Crow era. I like reading books from those perspectives, um, even from the slavery perspective, um, because uh, it, 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 because it's, it is an insight into the mind of people who existed back then. It puts you in touch with them, even though you can't speak to these people or have conversations with them. It puts you in touch with what their struggles were. And I honestly feel as though if we held our ancestors in, in more high regard and read more of their works from the past Jim Crow, Reconstruction, slavery, that we probably have better perspective on our lives today in the 21st century. We'd probably be able to circumnavigate a lot of the same issues we came to keep seeming to have happened over and over again. But I'll go ahead and get right into it. Ralph Waldo Ellison was an American, African-American novelist, literary critic, and scholar. He was born in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Ellison is best known for his novel, Invisible Man, which won the National Book Award in 1953. He also wrote Shadow Act, I'm sorry, Shadow and Act, 1964, a collection of political, social, and critical essays, and going to the Territory, 1986. For the New York Times, the best of these essays in addition to the novel put him among the gods of America's literary parnassus. A posthumous novel, Juneteenth, was published after being assembled from voluminous notes he left after his death. Ralph Waldo Ellison was born on March 1st, 1914 in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma and named after journalist and poet Ralph Waldo Emerson in the hopes that he would grow up to be a poet. Ellison's doting father, Lewis, who loved children and read books voraciously, worked as an ice and coal deliverer. He died from a work-related accident when Ellison was only three years old. His mother Ida then raised Ralph and younger brother Herbert by herself, working a variety of jobs to make ends meet. In 1920, Ellison's mother and her children moved to Gary, Indiana, where she had a brother. According to Ellison, his mother felt that, quote, my brother and I would have a better chance of reaching manhood if we grew up in the North, end quote. She did not find a job and her brother lost his. The family returned to Oklahoma, where Ellison worked as a busboy, a shoe shine boy, shoe shine boy, sorry, hotel waiter, and a dentist assistant. From the father of a neighborhood friend, he received free instructions for playing trumpet and alto saxophone, and would go on to become the school bandmaster. Ida remarried three times after Lewis died. However, the family was 
precarious and brought work various jobs during his youth and teens to assist with family support. While attending Douglas High School, he also found time to play on the school's football team. He graduated from high school in 1931. He worked for a year and found the money to make a down payment on a trumpet, using it to play with local musicians and to take further music lessons. At Douglas, he was influenced by Principal Iman E. Page and his daughter, music teacher, Zelia N. Bro. B-R-E-A-U-X, sorry if I pronounced that name wrong. In his future book of essays, Shadow and Act, Ellison described himself and several of his friends growing up as young Renaissance men. People who look to culture and intellectualism as a source of identity. A buddy instrumentalist, Ellison took up the con I'm sorry, took up the cornet at the age of eight and years later as a trumpeter attended Tuskegee Institute in Alabama where he studied music with his eye on becoming a symphony composer. At the age of 19, he won a scholarship to study music at the Booker T. Washington Tuskegee Institute. In 1936, he went to New York and there met the black writers Langston Hughes and Richard Wright. He started contributing to the Federal Writers Project set up as part of Roosevelt's New Deal, and soon his short stories and articles began to appear in magazines and journals. In 1943, he joined the United States Merchant Marines, returning to New York after the war. Awarded the Rosenwald Fellowship, he was able to con concentrate on his writing and, seven years after starting it, his masterpiece, Invisible Man, 1952 was published. Immediately recognized as a classic in its own time and described as a touchstone of the 1950s, it won the American National Book Award and established Ellison as one of the major figures of 20th century fiction. He also published two collections of essays, Shadow and Act, 1964, and Going to the Territory, 1960, I'm sorry, 1986. But his second novel, which he worked on for over four decades and repeatedly declared to be virtually finished, never appeared. Flying Home and Other Stories, Penguin, 1996, which is the publishing house, is a collection of both published and previously unpublished short stories. Ellison's outsider position at Tuskegee sharpened his satir satirical lens. Critic Hilton Alls believes, quote, standing apart from the university's air of sanctimonious negritude enabled him to write about it, end quote. In Passages of the Invisible Man, quote, he looks back with scorn and despair on the sniveling ethos that ruled at Tuskegee. So, from what I gather from that, apparently, from the time of Booker T. Washington running the school, basically, the, um, it, they started to produce what I guess will, will be known later on as the, um, the, the, the black bourgeoisie, um, which they already had, they had already existed, but apparently the school had turned into something else. Um, people believing because they were going to that school and could afford to go, that they were better than or had some sort of privilege, um, which basically, for the most part, is... As you can hear from that, black people taking on European states of mind and European attitudes when it comes to education and just the overall attitude of people believing that they are better than you because they have, uh, they come from certain financial backgrounds or just because they were gaining an education. So I thought that was inter interesting to learn how alienated he felt at the school. But moving on. As a child, Ellison evidenced what would become a lifelong interest in audio technology, starting by taking apart and rebuilding radios, and later moved on to constructing and customizing elaborate hi-fi radio stereo systems as an adult. He discussed this passion in a December 1958 essay, 
Living With Music in High Fidelity Magazine. Ellison, I'm sorry, Ellison scholar John S. Wright contends that this deftness with the ins and outs of electronic devices went on to inform Ellison's approach to writing and the novel form. Ellison remained at Tuskegee until 1936 and decided to leave before completing the requirements for a degree. Completing only three years majoring in music at Tuskegee, Ellison sometimes referred to himself as a college dropout. Ironically, Ellison went on to receive 12 honorary degrees from such prestigious universities as Tuskegee Institute, Rutgers University, and University of Michigan, and University, I'm sorry, Harvard University, I apologize. Desiring to study sculpture and photography, he moved to New York, where he found a YMCA room on 135th Street in Harlem, then the cultural capital of black America. He met Langston Hughes, Harlem's unofficial diplomat of the Depression era, and won as one of the country's celebrated black authors who could live from his writing. Hughes introduced him to the black literary establishment with communist sympathies. In 1938, Ellison met Rosa Araminta Poindexter, I hope I pronounced her middle name right, a woman two years his senior. They were married in late 1938. Rose was a stage actress and continued her career after their marriage. And biographer Brian Prasad assessment of Ellison's taste in women, he was searching for one, quote, physically attractive and smart, who would love, honor, and obey him, but not challenge his intellect, end quote. At first they lived at 312 West 122nd Street, Rose's apartment, but moved to 453 West 140th Street after her income shrank. In 1941, he briefly had an affair with seven-year-older white, white writer Sonora Babb, which he confessed to his wife afterward, and in 1943, the marriage was over. At the start of World War II, Ellison was class 1A, was classed 1A by the local selective service system, and thus eligible for the draft. However, he was not drafted. Toward the end of the war, like we've already mentioned, he enlisted in the Merchant Marine Service. In 1946, he married his second wife, Fanny McConnell. She worked as a photographer to help sustain Ellison. From 1947 to 51, he earned some money writing book reviews, but spent most of his time working on Invisible Man. Fanny also helped type Ellison's longhand text and assisted him in editing the typescript as it progressed. Ellison started writing what would become The Invisible Man while at a friend's farm in Vermont. The existential novel, published in 1952, focused on an African-American civil rights worker from the South who upon his move to New York, becomes increasingly alienated due to the racism he encounters. Upon its release, Invisible Man became a runaway hit, remaining on bestsellers lists for weeks and winning the National Book Award the following year. With billions of copies eventually printed, the novel would be regarded as a groundbreaking meditation on race and marginalized communities in America, influencing future generations of writers and thinkers. In writing Invisible Man in the late 1940s, Ralph Ellison brought onto the scene a new kind of black protagonist, one at odds with the characters of the leading black novelists at the time, Richard Wright. If Wright's characters were angry, uneducated, and inarticulate, the consequences of a society that oppressed them. Ellison's Invisible Man was educated, articulate, and self-aware. Ellison's view was that the African-American culture and sensibility was far from the downtrodden, unsophisticated picture presented by writers, sociologists, and politicians, 
both black and white. He posited instead that blacks had created their own traditions, rituals, and a history that formed a cohesive and complex culture that was the source of a full sense of identity. When the protagonist in Invisible Man comes upon a yam seller named Petit Wheatstraw after the black folklore figure, on the streets of Harlem and remembered his childhood and a flood of emotion, his proclamation, quote, I am what I am, end quote, is Ellison's expression of embracing one's culture as the way to freedom. Afterwards, Ellison published more of his words. Ellison became, began to teach both American and Russian literature at Bard College. He also began to work on Juneteenth, his second novel. He released a collection of essays, Shadow and Act, in 1964. He also started to teach at Yale University and Rutgers University while still working on Juneteenth. In 1965, Ellison received the honor of his book, Invisible Man, being declared the most important novel since the end of World War II by a survey of 200 prominent literary figures. Ellison was highly regarded by both the literary and academic worlds. He was Fellow of the American Academy in Rome from 1955 to 1957, and on his return, held several visiting professorships, latterly being Albert Schweitzer Professor in the Humanities at New York University. He received the United States Medal of Freedom in 1969, became, what is that, Chevalier de l'Ordre the art at Lich, that's French, I can't read French, sorry guys, in 1970, and received the National Medal of Arts in 1985. Ralph Ellison died in 1994 of cancer, April 16, 1994 to be exact, survived by his wife of 48 years, Fannie McConnell. In his obituary, the independent declared him a great, quote, a great gentleman, indeed a noble man, and the remarkable mytholo what is that? mythologizing author of the great American Negro novel. Mythologizing, that's, that's a new word for me, guys, sorry. M-Y-T-H-O-L-O-G-I-S-I-N-G. And this is a quote from uh, Ralph Ellison in his book, Invisible Man. Quote, no, I am not a spook like those who haunted Edgar Allan Poe, nor am I one of your Hollywood movie ectoplasms. I am a man of substance, of flesh and bone, fiber and liquids, and I might even be said to possess a mind. I am invisible, understand, simply because people refuse to see me. Like the bodiless heads you see sometimes in circus sideshows, it is as though I have been surrounded by mirrors of hard, distorting glass. When they approach me, they see only my surroundings, themselves, or figments of their imagination. Indeed, everything and anything except me. End quote. Ralph Ellison. That was actually pretty deep. After Ellison's death, more manuscripts were discovered in his home, resulting in the publication of Flying Home and other stories in 1996. In 1999, his second novel, Juneteenth, was published under the editorship of John F. Callahan, a professor at Lewis and Clark College and Ellison's literary executor. He was a 368-page, I'm sorry, it was a 368-page condensation of more than 2,000 pages written by Ellison over a period of 40 years. All the manuscripts of this incomplete novel were published collectively on January 26, 2010 by Modern Library under the title Three Days Before the Shooting. On February 18, 2014, the USPS, United States Postal Service, issued a 91-cent stamp honoring Ralph Ellison in its literary arts series. 
a park residing on 150th Street and Riverside Drive in Hall, near 730 Riverside Drive, Ellison's principal residence from the early 1950s until his death, was dedicated to Ellison on May 1, 2003. In the park stands a 15 by 8 foot bronze stab slab with a cutout man figure inspired by his book, Invisible Man. So, that's just a little a little introduction into the life of Ralph Edison. Edison I'm sorry, Ellison. I apologize for that. That's just a, a, a brief look into his life. Um, a literary giant, a very intelligent man, and again, a person who should be remembered by history, by black people. We need to remember the people who came before us, who have contributed so much to the world. But that's all I have for now. Um, enjoy some of the clips that I put in with some of the rare interviews with um, with Mr. Ellison, and um, and uh, uh, some clips from the documentary, which I'll actually play after I finish making my closing statements. Um, talking about the cutouts that were that were uh, actually that I actually spoke about in the in the last paragraph that I read to you guys. So. Now that it's so determined, like, learn, and subscribe, I'm out of peace. In the fall of 1965, the New York Herald Tribune asked 200 authors to name the best American works of fiction since the war. The book most often cited was Invisible Man. The result of seven years' work, this first novel won for its author the National Book Award in 1953. If you think about the Harlem Renaissance, Ralph Ellison was a very significant player. He lived at Riverside Drive and 150th Street, and that's where he died at that address. And his neighbors wanted to sort of honor him with a monument by where he lived. Elizabeth Catlin, an artist who was a contemporary of his, was honored with the opportunity. And she did this figure that reflected the invisible man.